Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for the Sermon Recap Podcast. It's a joy to be with y'all. It's good to be with Matt here today. I'm it's good to be Matt here. Karst. Greg's not with us today. He's on vacation, having a good time. Living hopefully. the dream. Living the dream. But here we are to talk about the weekend. Had a lot of fun this weekend, a lot of people this weekend, and it was a good day. It was a really good day. Good I've good loved days. I loved this whole series going it's through fun. it. Um, it's been good diving into Parables, I feel like we don't really dive into a lot as a church. We, we've mm-hmm. kind of gone into those deeper, which has been encouraging to hear people's feedback too because mm-hmm. um, I don't think a lot of people have ever really taken that time. So it's encouraging to hear people say, I think I might actually dive into Scripture a little bit more. Um, and then this week, you know, as a small guy that has had big dreams at some point in life, it, it hit home for me. Um, but no, I really love this, this whole idea, and I, I remember being super hungry all four services that you talked about biscuits. <laughs> I didn't get a biscuit either. Yeah. <laughs> if y'all weren't here, we talked about Bojangles a few times. and uh, Well, I did, actually. Somebody brought me a bag of Bojangles biscuits at the end of service, but I did not go to Bojangles for lunch. That's self-control. I had a burrito for lunch, as Good you job. know, because you were there. Right. Yeah, we talked about yeast yesterday. And uh, <laughs> probably the worst introduction I've ever done. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about yeast. yeast. And everybody looked at me just like you would expect yeah, they would. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Jesus did, though. He talked yeah. about yeast. And it was uh, it unfolded, uh, hopefully, as he meant it to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it did. I think, I mean, one of the most important things I, right there at the beginning was really remembering, like, he told those stories based on his audience. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, you know... He wasn't thinking about Bojangles. He was thinking about the people that woke up every morning, and that's what they did, and so he told mm-hmm. that story. So I love that you drew that out of it, mm-hmm. just to paint that picture. Yeah, he told them uh, things they all knew. Yeah. Farmer out scattering seed. I guess a huge percentage of his listeners had done that. The mustard seed, mm-hmm. they had done that. And making bread, the, uh, the women in the crowd, they were right with him. And I think it says something about Jesus' appeal to uh, Jesus' uh, intentionality about giving stories. Because he told one that, and and this is not to, you know, we live in a culture where people say things are sexist and all that. I understand that. It wasn't sexist at all. It was just he knew knew his audience very well. And the men in that day would have been the ones out scattering the seed Mm -hmm. and out uh, sowing seed and tilling the ground and all that. And the women were the ones who would have been making the bread. That's just what it was like in the first century. And... uh, Jesus uh, told stories that each of them could readily relate to. Yeah, right there in that in that one chapter, we get those. Yeah, and I love that about Jesus. He mm-hmm. he speaks to who he's speaking to. Yeah, um, but it's really still does. crazy that we can open it up today, and it speaks to us. Which is, yeah, it's powerful. That's a whole other message here. If you want to talk about that, and maybe we do, maybe we don't, but apparently we're going to. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if uh, you want to think about Jesus' role with uh, women. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, oftentimes people um, think the church keeps women down and pushes women down and, oh, yeah. and doesn't appreciate them, and, and I guess that's probably happened. I saw a video somebody sent the other day of some pastor preaching about tell your wife to be quiet. Did you yeah. see that one? Uh, yeah, I've seen it. That was, I, have, I just saw it recently, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, where in the world does that sort yeah. of spirit come from? Yeah. Jesus had a ministry um, had a special ministry. Um, that's probably not the best way to put it. Jesus ministered to women in a way. The f- very first person he told that we have recorded that he was the Messiah, because he didn't just throw that out to everybody. He didn't just show up at the first of his ministry saying, hey, Messiah here, you know, it's me. Uh, the very first person he told was the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman who'd been in at least five different marriages, you know. So, so he had a, a ministry to Mary Magdalene. You know, he delivered her from seven demons, I think it was. And so um, Jesus just, uh, just, and he really broke the cultural norms mm-hmm. of his day, yeah. you know, to reach people who others wouldn't. The woman at the well specifically when um, he was sitting there and the disciples had gone away to buy food and they come walking back in. And there he's sitting talking to a woman, and they're kind of shocked. They're kind of aghast that he's there alone with that woman. Yeah. So, yeah, he crossed all kinds of lines. He did indeed. It was, but we didn't talk about that at all this weekend. Yeah, that tied in perfectly to this week. Didn't it? 
We make the rules, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. No, I loved it. I loved how you talked uh, about just little, how a little can go a long way. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was a perfect example of really the kingdom and what it looks like to take a little, you know, and invest is the word I'm thinking of, but I'm not talking about financially, just like being okay with taking the little that you have and investing in his kingdom, whatever capacity. And I really got to thinking, I get a, the chance to hear it four times. So as you're talking the fourth time, I'm usually thinking about it, like trying to think through, well, what about this? Um, just this idea of like how many people don't even take that step, you know, to invest the little, whatever that is, because they don't think it's big enough for God to use in some capacity. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. I think sometimes small investments are just overlooked. You know, we've all heard, a lot of us anyway, have heard Dave Ramsey talk about right. financial investing. And people think, okay, if I, if I can't put several hundred dollars a month into this account, it's really not worth it. Yeah. And I've heard uh, Dave Ramsey mention several times, and I, I don't have all the math in my head, but he would mention this small investment over this period of time would produce this. Right. And it's like, wow. It's, it's like uh, he said before, you know, I think I heard one recently about $50 or $100 a month, something like that, that if you just stuck that in an account, a good interest-bearing account, mm -hmm. good stock or mutual fund, that over the lifetime between the time somebody's 25 and 65, it produces a quite a significant chunk of money. Yeah. Um, and we're just not just talking about money here, but uh, I think it goes along with the idea that little investments pay off in the long run. Yeah. And they multiply sure. in the kingdom specifically. Yeah, and that was the part that hit me. It's like you're not, it's not even that you're entrusting your $50 to a bank or an account or whatever. It's you're entrusting whatever that little thing that you think is little that he gifted you, you're entrusting that back to him. And he's the one that's going to multiply it. And he's the one that's got the interest that he's going to pour out on it. So it's like, it's really more, it takes us back to the, the talents again, you know, like he's entrusted you with that little bit to see what you're going to do with it. I think sometimes we really underestimate our contribution to things as well. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the congregation probably does not realize how important they are to the work of the Lord, mm -hmm. not only in the church, but in the community. Yeah. You know, you and I get to be on the stage a lot. So you and I get uh, people looking at us. I get tons of people who thank me for uh, all I've done for them and all this. And, and in reality, many of them, I've not had very little personal contact with them other than saying hello, you know. Yeah. Uh, other people have been there and worked with them. And uh, I think often people just, just underestimate what they do. You know, we have people come in to church often and uh, they get saved and they come to Christ. And I wonder if the parking lot attendants and the greeters and the people at the desk and the children's ministry workers, I wonder sometimes if they understand that their investment of their time made all that. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm the guy up there who gets to pray the prayer and it's like, yeah, you know, I, I, sometimes I hate that attention because it, it takes the focus off some of the people yeah. who really did the work in a lot of ways. I'm not underestimating what you and I do as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot goes into that. But uh, when, a, when a parent drops their child off with a nursery worker, let's say, and they feel like that child is safe, you just took a load off their mind so they could go in there mm -hmm. and listen. And uh, that little investment yeah. paid off big time. I always, I always see that as, a, a, I'm, I guess, a visual person, but I, people walk in with walls, maybe unintentionally, but yeah. every interaction that they have with somebody throughout this place, it's, they're taking a brick off, you know? Yep. So where when they get to that moment where mm -hmm. they do get that gospel presentation, <clears throat> yeah. they're able to hear it. That's a great way to look at yeah. that. It's powerful. But that's the message of that parable in a big way. And a little goes a long way. Yeah, You can try to make some stuff out of it. And I mentioned yesterday, and it, it bugs me on this one, on this parable, because there was so much disagreement mm -hmm. on it. And there were some preachers and some pastors that totally disagreed with what I would preach yesterday, not, not in terms of the truth, the truth of what of I the said. Yeah, yeah. They would agree with that, I think. Yeah. But they would not agree that that's what this parable was saying. Right. There are many great pastors and preachers out there that I highly respect that preach this a different way, that say mm -hmm. what this leaven represents is sin and compromise cre creeping into the mm -hmm. church. 
And, and there is truth, and I said this in at least one yesterday, there's absolute truth that if you allow compromise, sin to creep in, yeah. it can take over a church, a life, whatever. But I truly believe this parable was a positive parable. Right. Um, I don't believe Jesus is going to tell us, well, the kingdom of God is like this, this powerful kingdom that once you get a hold of is going to crash and burn. Yeah. I, I just don't see it that oh, way. That, that, for me, you know, and I get that there's opposing sides to it, but I, I just, when you look at his parables, that's not how he tells them. He tells them from a, more the positive aspect of this is what the kingdom is like. When I was growing up in Bible college, we were warned about a theology, and, and, and I'm stepping in it by mentioning labels now, I know, with some people. We were warned about what was called kingdom now theology, hmm. right? And it was pictured as a, as a deception, as a false teaching by many. I've come to understand I would not embrace everything under that banner. Right. However, I've come to understand that when Jesus prayed, taught us to pray, mm -hmm. He said, pray, <clears throat> thy kingdom come, mm -hmm. thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as I read that, I understand that, that what we're called to be is representatives and ambassadors of God's kingdom here on earth. Mm -hmm. We are to bring His kingdom and His authority, His power to this earth mm -hmm. through the church. I believe that's what we're called to do. And now people can run with their theology and I'm certain I'm wrong about stuff and they are too. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm well, convinced yeah. that I'm going to be wrong about some things in heaven. But I'm not going to surrender to the theology or eschatology that the church is going down, that the church is going to be weak. Right. Um, and I've told people before, I've argued this with people and I said, okay, if, if you're right, if the church is going to decline, I'm going to make sure that the church I lead is not one of them. Yeah, and that's good. And I, I struggle to get behind it as well. Like it's like, I mean, all throughout Scripture, it's the kingdom is being built up. Why would He ask us to pray that? That I mean, Scripture says the gates of hell won't prevail against His church. Yeah. Like that's why He died was for His church. So it's a, not to get into a big debate about it, but I just. I would be curious to sit down with someone and just kind of talk that out. Like, what leads you to think that? I did, I did uh, in the study for this parable series, I was looking at the parable of the sower. We, we kind of touched on that parable mm -hmm. in the week before and I heard one pastor preaching about how he felt that the parable of the sower means that only a fourth of the people to whom you present the gospel will ever respond. Mm -hmm. That three quarters of the people will not. And uh, and I thought to myself, okay, I don't think that parable was meant for us to dole out exact percentages. Math. It wasn't meant to give percentages. There are four representations in the parable, mm -hmm. and three of the four, the word didn't produce any fruit, and one of the four it did. But I don't think that's justification for saying 20, only 25% of the people are going to respond to the message. That's you pretty can, good odds, though. Uh, yeah. That's, I can stop four people a day easy. Absolutely. You get one a day, that's not bad. <laughs> I just, I, I believe you get a lot more done being optimistic about yeah. things. And uh, there's enough pessimism and negative out in the world that, man, I don't want to be doling that out to people when they come to church. Yeah. Well, and I love that, I mean, you kind of ended on that kind of last takeaway of staying on the offense. Because mm -hmm. I, again, just in thinking about that, I think so much of our culture has led us to be defensive, like to defend our thoughts or you're right, I'm wrong. And you get on social media, it's easy to go down a rabbit hole of videos of people attacking other video, other people and other thoughts. and that, So that's where it led me, was just like, what would it look like for us as a church to stay on the offense? And instead of feeling, I mean, I think we should always be ready to defend our faith, but that not be the goal of why we're doing what we're doing. What does it look like for us to win? So when you said stay on the offense, where it led me was what is the win? Like what are we aiming at? Does that make sense? It does. It's so easy in our, in our culture today to get on the defensive. Mm -hmm. Someone comes against what we believe. Mm -hmm. And this, if we get defensive, we're being just like the world. Because mm -hmm. that's what's going on in the world today. The world has a 
and I, there are people all over the spectrum of this, but in general, the culture has this thing going on now that you cannot disagree with me and we still get along. Right. Civil discourse is, is becoming a lost art because as soon as I challenge your view on something, people can just put up the defenses really fast. And what's happening with a lot of Christians is they're doing the same thing. When we get pushed back on about things, we, we put up our defenses and we start uh, getting down in the bunker and just lobbing grenades at each other, you know, verbal grenades. And uh, the Christian doesn't have to do that. We yeah. do not have to run and hide when people disagree with us, you know? Yeah. When we sit down with someone who disagrees with us on marriage or sexuality or identity issues or whatever it may be, on uh, just the way we live our lives, we don't have to raise up a bunch of walls and hate them. Right. And we don't need to think they hate us because they don't agree with us. Right. Uh, we just need to, to say, hey, I'm put here to extend an invitation for people to come to know Jesus. And that's been a powerful kind of a shift for me in my life and my way of thinking. And it happened a couple of years ago that, that I'm not out there shaming people because of their behavior. I'm not out there saying, oh, you do this, this is horrible. I recognize sin. And I recognize right. the destructive power of it, and our, our job as citizens is to call people out of that. But I recognize my role is not to go shame a culture, but to give them an invitation to something better that Jesus has for them. Yeah. Because he really does. Well, and that's the, that's the win. That's the offense is how do I get that person that I yes. want to be defensive about how do I get them to the end zone or, you know, whatever sport you're playing? You know, like, that's the win I really want. So defense isn't going to get me there. Yeah. So it's powerful. So much in our day-to-day -day is trying to talk people out of things they believe. It's like, right. well, you believe this. Here's why this is wrong. Here's Nobody wins an argument. Yeah. Even if you can convince a guy, let's say you back him into a corner, right? Mm -hmm. You see the videos all the time, and I'm tempted to watch them too, that says so-and-so gets owned. Exactly. Right. <laughs> got to watch that. And you got some brilliant minds. You'll have this brilliant mind who may be liberal or conservative or whatever, but you got this brilliant mind at a podium and someone will ask a question. And this brilliant minded person up here will just, just skewer them, you know? That's not a win. Yeah. The video usually it, stops. It may be well. a win of ideas. You know what I mean? Right. It may yeah. be a win that the idea is brought forth. And I get that. And if it's in a public thing, then. It could be a win for the audience to say, yeah, okay, I see that, okay. So in that sense, there could be some win there. But it's not a win for that person if the only thing you did was tick them off and drive them further away. Yeah. I'm not saying we can't debate. I'm not saying that logic has no place in this. I'm yeah. simply saying our job is not to win arguments, it's to win people. Right. And it's pretty easy to get everybody that already agrees to you with you to cheer, you know. Like, sure. And uh, the videos that I've been sucked into watching, that's usually what happens. The people that already agree with you, yay, d disagree on the other side. I mean, it's the, and it's the same on both sides of those arguments. And I, I mean, I get it because it sells and people want to watch it, so they keep doing it. But I don't really get, like, how did we get to that place just as people? <laughs> um, yeah. But I also go, I loved how you ended with the, your adventurous tea room <laughs> story. Um, I can't wait for you to go and get that T-shirt. I said the wrong place. It's uh, in one. It's not Twinings. Actually, it's Celestial. 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 I think I might have a Celestial box of that seasonings. It's in Boulder, Colorado. I'm going to go to the Mint Room the at mint some room. point if I ever get a chance to go back out there. Uh, yeah, along those lines, it's, it, you said it's so easy to get people to cheer that agree with you. You know, we could have this rally it upward where I mm -hmm. just got up and banged the pulpit about everything we agree with, and I found myself probably 10 times over the last three or four years uh, in a service just having to say to people, okay, yeah. let's not get too excited. Not because I don't want to rally people to a cause. I don't want us to rejoice because we're right and they're wrong. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't want that. I want us to rejoice because we're leading people closer to Jesus. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah, that's straight up. Truth is Difficult still there. Truth. Yeah, it's yeah. still there. We're not compromising what we believe. I want us to shout for the right things. Mm -hmm. That's good. That could have been one of your points. Shout for the right things. Shout for the right things. <laughs> like All right. It.
Thank you all for being with us today. We're going to end this, and we will see you next week. It's going to be a good week. Thanks again. Appreciate you all. See you.